This video talks about regulation of cerebral perfusion. If you want to follow along with me, please, please feel free to do so by going to page 443, first aid, 2012. This chapter should have been under respiratory as well, but, you know, they put it under neuro and that's okay, but I'd like to talk about it under uh, respiratory because it's very, very important. So, on the x-axis of both this graph, we have arterial gas pressure. And on the y-axis, we have cerebral perfusion pressure. And this one is for oxygen. Okay. And this one is going to be for carbon dioxide. Okay. This should be carbon dioxide. My apologies. So what can we see? What do we really see in this graph? We see that... What is the normal level, normal value of oxygen? Normal value of oxygen is about 100, right? Partial pressure of oxygen being 100. So at about 100, what kind of effect does it have on the cerebral perfusion pressure? It has very, very, you know, you know what? Not very. It has almost no effect. When it's 90, does it have any effect? No. 80, 70. It keeps co coming down until the level of oxygen becomes half of the normal. Only then, when it's that much reduced, only then it has a big effect on the cerebral perfusion pressure. And we see the cerebral perfusion pressure rising in a steep curve. Okay, So this is very, very important. So oxygen or the partial pressure of oxygen has very little effect on the cerebral perfusion pressure until it drops to a value less than 50. Okay. So if you say oxygen has no effect on the cerebral perfusion pressure, that would be wrong. It's, it only has a big effect when it drops below 50. Now this is for oxygen. Now let's talk about carbon dioxide. For carbon dioxide, you see as the level of carbon dioxide increases, okay, it keeps on having more and more effect on the cerebral perfusion pressure because the level of carbon dioxide increasing more, more, more. Now, what is the normal value of carbon dioxide? The normal value of carbon dioxide is about 40. So imagine that this is, this is not a very accurate um, scale diagram, but you know, go with me here. So let's say this is normal. So even after when the carbon dioxide level keeps on increasing, we are having, we are seeing more and more effect on the cerebral perfusion pressure. But it kind of stabilizes after about 50. So when the level of carbon dioxide reaches 50 after that it's pretty stable i mean no more effect can have on the cerebral perfusion pressure it kind of normalizes up after 50. so to summarize these two things oxygen has a big effect on the cerebral perfusion pressure when it drops below 50. carbon dioxide has no more effect when it rises above 50. okay so that those are the two graphs but there is a lot more we have to know about this topic. So before we move on with this topic, there is one thing I want to clear up, and that is there is a direct correlation between carbon dioxide content and the PCO2, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Obviously, you know this is the dissolved uh, carbon dioxide in the plasma, but it has a direct relationship with the content. The relationship is like so. So that means if the level of carbon dioxide contents goes up, the PCO2 goes up. If the PCO2 goes up, carbon dioxide contents go down. And if one comes down, the other comes down. They're directly proportional. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, let's talk about alveolar ventilation. Now, the alveolar ventilation is really dependent on the chemical composition of the blood. And the, chem the chemical composition of the blood is determined by the pH, the level of carbon dioxide, PCO2, which is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, that's a dissolved carbon dioxide. And we talked about that how the dissolved carbon dioxide is directly correlated to the carbon dioxide content, and also the PO2, the partial pressure of oxygen. So these three things really determine alveolar ventilation. And they determine alveolar ventilation through two types of receptors. Okay. Uh, one set of the receptors are called the central chemoreceptors and the other set of the receptors are called the peripheral chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors are found on the surface of the medulla. Okay? Now let's talk about the peripheral chemoreceptors. I've drawn a 
very basic diagram here. This is the heart, you know, <laughs> and this is the aortic arch, the carotid to the, the, the two carotid arteries. Now you see, I've drawn a little more than we have to know for this particular topic because there could be um, confusion or you could mix up. There's a possibility of mix up, so that's why I put the two things together. See, on the aortic arch, there is the aortic chemoreceptors right here. Just beside it, there is also the aortic baroreceptors, and the aortic baroreceptors determines the blood pressure, right? So, but we're not going to talk about the aortic baroreceptors, we're just going to talk about the aortic chemoreceptors. So there's the aortic chemoreceptors, and then there is a carotid, the car carotid body. The, car the carotid body is responsible for the chemoreceptors in the carotid artery, okay? The other one is called the carotid sinus. The carotid sinus is responsible for the baroreceptor, the carotid, and the carotid body is the chemoreceptor. So the two peripheral chemoreceptors are going to be the aortic chemoreceptors and the carotid body chemoreceptors. Okay, these are the peripheral ones, where the central ones are present in the medulla. Now let's first talk about the central chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors respond to two things, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. It does not respond to, it does not respond to oxygen. Now imagine that this is the blood brain barrier and carbon dioxide is freely permeable to the blood brain barrier, okay? So carbon dioxide can easily enter inside the inside the brain and it can stimulate the medulla okay it can stimulate the medulla but this is not the only thing that stimulates the central chemoreceptor there is also the hydrogen ion right the hydrogen ion is also here but do you think hydrogen ion can enter the blood brain barrier no it cannot the carbon dioxide inside the CSF is going to generate hydrogen ion which is going to stimulate the medulla to breathe more okay this is a very very important concept so now we can conclude that the hydrogen ion of the CSF has a big effect on the medulla or on respiration, but the CSF, the hydrogen ion from the systemic circulation has almost no effect on the medulla, right? Because this hydrogen ion is not really entering uh, the, the brain. Okay, so my next question is, are there any oxygen receptors or PO2 receptors in the, centr in the central chem chemoreceptors? Absolutely not. There is no oxygen chemoreceptors in the in the medulla. So another thing we have to know here is that if we had to compare which one has a bigger effect on the drive of alveolar ventilation, that is going to be our central chemoreceptors. That is the big boss of alveolar ventilation. Okay, if central chemoreceptors are gone, we're not going to be breathing. Anyway, so that was our central chemoreceptors. Now let's talk about the peripheral chemoreceptors. And we'll be talking about the uh, aortic chemoreceptors and the aortic body, which are the peripheral chemoreceptors.